1981, a young Swede called Uwe Bergsten strolled through Singapore to pass the time before his flight home. After a busy Christmas running his electronics shop, he and his business partners had travelled to the Far East, idly looking for the products they could import before the next Christmas. Passing a camera shop, he spotted a two-button LCD game called Fire RC4 in the window. An acquaintance had told him not long before that LCD games were the future, far better than the simple LED handhelds people had been playing recently. Uwe bought it on a whim. Sitting down for the flight, he turned it on and got hooked. He played it for the entirety of the return flight, playing past the pad with his seat neighbour. When that flight was unexpectedly diverted due to fog, he played it on the three-hour bus ride he was then forced to take back home to Gothenburg. As he travelled, always playing or waiting to play, he started to wonder who'd made this compulsive little rectangle, and if he could sell them too. Besides the labels for the buttons, he didn't have much to go on when it came to information on the console itself. Game & Watch, Made in Japan, Nintendo. That last word seemed the best lead, so he called a local trade organisation and came away with a telex number. Soon after, somewhere in its tiny Tokyo export office, a Nintendo employee pulled a short and extremely abbreviated message out of a printer. It read, Over three decades later, an older, wiser, richer Bergsten looks at me across a table, presenting the telex he sent after the first. His well-appointed office sits in a building furnished by the money he's made through, for and with Nintendo over the years. That's not an exaggeration, the building's address is Mario's Gutter 21, 21 Mario Street. This telex set the course for the rest of Bergsten's life, introduced Nintendo to Europe on a scale it had never seen, and arguably helped pave the way for its move into Western markets as a whole. Without this piece of paper, gaming as we know it could be entirely different. At that time it was very easy to lie, because the internet was not invented. So, I ask him, that first formal communication to Nintendo was a lie? Yeah, <laughs> of course. I first heard of Uwe Bergsten in a pub in 2017. His story told like some kind of Swedish folktale. It was the story of a man, a lie, a video game handheld, and a business empire. And it was told with such breathless enthusiasm that I kept buying pints so that I could hear more. This man sounded less like a successful business owner than some globe-hopping trickster hero. And the more I speak to people who know him, the more it becomes apparent that that's just how people talk about Uwe Bergsten. Two weeks later, unable to stop wondering if anything about the story I'd heard was actually true, I organised to meet Bergsten at his office. When I arrived, I explained that I'd love for him to tell me his story from the beginning, how he got here. Bergsten clearly understands his public perception, even plays up to it. You want the true version? He joked. I have much better versions. I'm not entirely sure that's possible. Today, Bergsten's company Bergsala effectively is Nintendo Sweden. It's also Nintendo Denmark, Norway and Finland. Scroll to the bottom of any of these regions' official Nintendo websites, you'll see the name Bergsala as part of the copyright information. It's a position it takes seriously. Kids travel to its nondescript headquarters, situated off a motorway exit south of Gothenburg, just to see the Mario warp pipe that pokes incongruously through the suburban scenery. There's a Nintendo museum, or possibly a shrine, in the Bergsala lobby, complete with a picture of a young Bergsten beaming in a pile of Game & Watches. In his office, there's a signed Miyamoto sketch of Mario, with hand-drawn Super Mario World font-style text reading, To Mr. Bergsten. It's not just a testament to what Nintendo did for Bergsala, but vice versa. In many ways, Sweden, through Bergsala, became a Western testing ground for Nintendo, a huge early success that proved there was a desire for the work of Miyamoto and Gunpei Yokoi outside of their homeland. And it was built, in the nicest possible way, on a lie. A very simple lie. Bergsten used his telex to present Bergsala as a much bigger company than it was, a distribution organisation capable of acting as Nintendo's sole Swedish distributor for Game & Watch. Essentially, it didn't sound like an electronics shop with a side hustle in Asian imports. It would have been unthinkable for Bergsten to guess where that little fabrication would take him. 
but he very nearly didn't cross the first few hurdles on that journey at all. What followed feels more like a stage farce than a business success story. After selling a sample run of 250 Game & Watch units, Bergson organised to visit both Nintendo's Tokyo export office and its HQ in Kyoto. Because he wasn't yet a wealthy man, he booked what he calls the very, very cheapest tickets. He'd have a grand total of two days to visit two unfamiliar cities. He couldn't change his flight dates, and if anything went wrong, he'd be speaking English, a second language to him, to people who might not even speak it at all. And then, across the world, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10's engine just stopped working during takeoff. Guess what model of plane Bergston was booked to fly on the next day? The day of his flight, all intact DC-10s were grounded for a day for checks, which really doesn't seem quite enough in retrospect. He was forced to stay a night at the airport, leaving him with a single day to cover both cities. It wasn't feasible, and he made the choice to head straight to Kyoto. He arrived on a Thursday night, went to bed exhausted, and woke on Friday with a plan to call Nintendo to let the team know what had happened, and when he'd arrive at HQ. I first called the Tokyo office, and there was some answering machine saying something which I didn't understand. Then I called the Kyoto office, and there was another answering machine I didn't understand. So I called my hotel reception and asked, can you call this number please and tell me what they are saying? The receptionist called back a minute later. They are saying that today is a national holiday in Japan, so everything is closed. He'd gone from two days to meet Nintendo, to one day, to none at all. His flight home was that weekend. Unless he tried something else, he would have flown to Japan for nothing and missed his chance to meet anyone from Nintendo. He summed up a tried and tested strategy. He told a little lie and managed to persuade Japan Airlines to extend his trip. He told them that this was an emergency, that it wasn't his fault, that he had to stay longer, things like that. And it worked, again, and he had the Monday to, in his words, force his way into Kyoto. After nearly missing his train that would actually get him there, I told you this was a farce, he finally made it with no real plan of what to do other than just turn up and ask for someone to talk to him. Uwe Bergsten tells me he has four rules for conducting conversations with Japanese businessmen, learned from a friend before his trip to meet Nintendo and still helpful today. They're as follows. Number one, always bring a gift. It should not be a wooden thing or anything. It should be crystal glass. This is the only thing you should buy. Number two, don't nag. In the Western culture, we can blah, 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 too many things. In Japanese culture, you should not ask for too much. The important things you should concentrate on to achieve them. Number three, try to get them to invite you to lunch, or even better, dinner. Number four, you'll never meet the right person because you have a wall of protection. You'll meet someone on the periphery. You need to work to meet who you need to. All of these would come into play as he negotiated his first major deal with Nintendo. In what's fast becoming clear is a typical Bergston move, his first action was to just tell Nintendo's export manager that he was in town unannounced and ask to come to the office. Then came the negotiation, and rule number two, don't nag, a rule which he didn't immediately remember. First, he asked for the distribution rights for Sweden. Then he asked for Scandinavia. Then he asked for all of Europe. Remember, this is a man who owns an electronics shop business. He's just pretending to own a distribution network. And then he remembered rule two, I suddenly realized that this was not the way to do it. So I asked for Sweden and we talked. We just talked. They talked about a lot more than distribution rights. Bergsten explained Swedish history, Swedish culture. He laid out his country as much like a tourism guide as it was an advert for his business. And he did it with an ulterior motive. I wanted the time to pass and suddenly lunchtime came. Rule number three. He said, shall we go for lunch? Yes, of course, I said, that would be fantastic. Even better, lunch got abandoned in favour of a three-hour dinner. Well, dinner and drinks. He drank a lot. I mean, we both drank a lot, so he was not 100% sober when he let me off at the hotel. It laid the perfect groundwork for the pièce de résistance. Rule number one. I said, I have a small gift for you. I would like to thank you very much for taking such good care of me. He handed the export manager a package, which he opened immediately. A small crystal ashtray. Then when we got out of the car, he said to me, OK, you can have Sweden. The white-ish lies, the bullish approach to business, the rules, and perhaps most of all the alcohol, led to a decision that altered the gaming business. But then a kicker. His new friend told him that the minimum order was 10,000 units. Bergseller had found it hard to sell 250 Game & Watches in the months previous. And that's not even taking into account the money involved. 10,000 units was the equivalent of something like 100,000 euro in orders. That was a lot of money at that time for a small electronics dealer. 
Bergstrom went home, had what he calls some very, very tough negotiations with the bank, and ordered 10,000 new gaming watches. And then, because he's Uwe Bergsten, he upped the order to 30,000. He never really tells me why. Christmas 1981, less than a year after his trip to Singapore, was when Bergsten's approach finally paid dividends. But rather than a holiday boom, it was just the start. Those 30,000 units sold out quickly. In the first three months of 1982, Bergsten says the company sold 180,000 units. A month. Bergsten and Nintendo each knew they were onto a winner. In June of 82, Bergsten returned to Japan, and Nintendo showed him its new dual-screen Game & Watches, which included a simplified version of Donkey Kong, the Miyamoto-made coin-op that had exploded in arcades around the world at around the same time as Bergsten's early successes. It was clear how well this was going to do from the outset. We bought as many as we could. We went around in Sweden showing this to big toy dealers. It was the best sales trip I've ever been on, because everybody wanted it. The demand was as unmanageable as it was welcome. In the Christmas of 82, if a customer ordered 100 units, they got one. By early 1983, Bergsala had sold 1.7 million Game & Watches in Sweden. To get a measure of that success, bear in mind quite how small Sweden is. In 1983, it was a country of around 8.3 million people. Bergson breaks this down further. We were aiming for around 7 to 12, something like that. And only boys, almost only boys. If you take that target group, you could say that probably every kid had five games. By comparison, Bergsten says that Germany, 61 million people in 1983, sold as much in a year as Sweden did in a month. It's not easy to check the validity of those figures. Nintendo doesn't release them publicly, but it's very clear that Sweden massively overperformed. But then, in Sweden, in 1983, Game & Watch just stopped selling. You might expect, at this point, for the story to go from boom to bust, but it didn't work out like that. While Europe had been interested in Game & Watch, but still relatively ignorant of Nintendo as a whole, Bergsten suspected that the company behind his breakout success was going to be useful for more than its LCD games. He kept in touch, despite the downturn, even kept paying to visit, despite he and Nintendo having nothing to show one another. It was a worthwhile expense. Bergsten thinks it was in August 1983 that Nintendo showed him the Famicom for the very first time. Nintendo's landmark home console had been released in Japan the month before, and was already a huge success. Bergsten took home some sample units, and a TV capable of displaying the foreign NTSC signal they outputted. He became convinced that it would be another Game & Watch for him, inspired in part by the reaction of his staff. All our personnel came early in the morning, they didn't go for lunch and they stayed late in the evening just to play, play, play. He begged Nintendo to just release the Famicom in the West, but Nintendo said the flop of the Atari 2600 the year before and the resulting video games crash meant it couldn't be confident in a TV-based game product. History tells us that Nintendo would recreate the Famicom as the Nintendo Entertainment System, releasing it in the US in 1985 and Europe in 1986. It's perhaps the biggest testament to just how much Uwe Bergsten had impressed Nintendo that history almost played out differently. Bergsten kept visiting and kept begging. In 1984, Nintendo showed him an early version of Super Mario Bros. He thinks he may even have been the first foreigner ever to see the game. And he only begged more. It got to the point where Nintendo, possibly just to shut him up, suddenly seemed to change its mind. Nintendo told Bergsten that because Sweden was the only European country interested in it, it would simply release a version of the original Famicom there and nowhere else. This wasn't idle talk. His company put in an order between 5,000 and 10,000 units. Later that year, as the US got the NES, Nintendo changed its mind. It wanted to create a European NES, tailored for the entire market. In retrospect, Bergsten says it was the correct decision, but it feels like only he could have forced Nintendo to make an incorrect one through sheer force of charm. NES, somewhat inevitably at this point, became a huge success for Bergsala, and more or less cemented the company as a permanent partner for Nintendo. Bergsten became a part of the furniture. He was the first person outside of Nintendo to play the Game Boy, he played golf with the company's board members, and has always stayed in touch with that export manager he'd gotten drunk with all those years ago. As Nintendo's wealth and power grew, it expanded more confidently into the West. Nintendo of America, which had opened in 1980 as a coin-op-focused business, was transformed into a fully-fledged arm of the core business. Not long after, it adopted one of Bergsala's most unique business moves. We started the Nintendo Club, and they copied that. When NES launched, Bergsala had created a members club, 
a way to connect the kids looking forward to its titles, inform them about upcoming releases, and, inevitably, put pressure on stores to buy in stock of games as those kids came in to ask when those same games would be available. It was an incredible success, an almost hilariously devious, corporate-sponsored grassroots movement. At one point, around 5% of the entire Swedish population was a part of Bergsala's Nintendo Club. It's no surprise that after Bergsten had a golf meeting with Nintendo of America founder Minoru Arakawa, Nintendo Fun Club suddenly appeared, followed by the apocal Nintendo Power. Bergsten is too humble to say that his company and its successes were an inspiration for Nintendo to expand into the West so suddenly and meaningfully, but his club is proof that Nintendo was very much paying attention. Elsewhere, Bergsala's influence is much easier to spot. Nintendo of Europe was founded in 1990 and began creating country-specific businesses across the continent, except in Scandinavia. It's a mark of the esteem with which Bergsala's held that not only did Nintendo apparently turn down lucrative offers from other companies to run its Swedish operation, it actively encouraged Bergsala to take over distribution across Scandinavia as a whole. In the early days, Nintendo worked almost exclusively with third-party distributors for its Western releases. Today, Bergsala is the only non-Nintendo-owned Nintendo distributor in the world. In the context of that global operation, Bergsala doesn't really have to deal directly with Nintendo Japan anymore. But Bergsten calls his contacts there on their birthdays, and returns every year just to stay in touch. I like to think he still turns up at the office unannounced for old time's sake. He tells me it's a business tactic, but I feel like it's something closer to friendship. He may have told a lie to get Nintendo's business, but the key was that that lie came out of love. He was a fan of Nintendo from its very first handheld, and he remained so. Nintendo saw that love and gave him loyalty in return. Bergsten's repaid that loyalty and even paid it forward. His company now co-owns several game developers and publishers, many of whom started as bullish, Bergsten-like upstarts themselves, and now release games for Nintendo platforms. It's mind-boggling to think of the magnitude at which that one opening lie has had a positive effect. A butterfly flapping wings made of telex paper. Eventually, and inevitably, that flap hit me too. Back in 2017, when I finished conducting this interview, I said my goodbyes to Uwe and headed to Gothenburg Airport. And while I waited for my flight, I started working on a preview I'd been putting off writing. It was for Super Mario Odyssey. As I wrote, I got enthused, got lost in the moment, and when I looked up again, I'd missed my flight home. After I stopped screaming, it popped into my head just how neat a coincidence it was that I'd been writing about a game Bergsala would be selling in just a few months. And then I started thinking about how that game could be traced back through the years, the number of decisions made just half an hour down the road that could legitimately have led to a point where there wasn't a Super Mario Odyssey to write about. If Bergsala hadn't set the precedent, would the Nintendo of Europe office where I saw the game even exist? If the NES release date had changed, would it have been hit by the video game crash and changed how Nintendo makes consoles? Hell, I started my career at official Nintendo magazine, itself a reflection of those Nintendo Club brochures. Would I be writing at all without them? If Bergsten hadn't lied, would any of this be the same? None of it is certain, and it hinges on the man who sent that telex. And then I snapped back to reality. I still had to get a plane home. I decided to nab a technique from the man I'd just spent an afternoon talking to. I queued for the airline check-in desk, and when I got to the front, I told them I had to get home today. It was an emergency, that they should change my ticket for free. If he could do it back in 1981 and build a mutually beneficial business empire on the back of it, I could manage it for a budget flight to Luton Airport. Of course it didn't work. I'm no Uwe Bergsten. <laughs>